solubility and the feasibility of a basic income. Uh, and um, I'm not going to say that much about the desirability, um, but I, I will uh, tell you what my position is, um, so you know from, from, from the beginning. Uh, I'm against the idea of a basic income uh, guarantee, and I, I am for the simple reason that I don't believe that uh, if you are able to provide for yourself, you have a claim on others to provide for it. So that's my very basic principle for society, I believe in that you, you, you cannot claim uh, an income from other taxpayers if you are able to to to, uh, to 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 provide for yourself. So that would be my very basic principle. We happen to go into that uh, discussion, uh, but for now, I'm just going to say that my basic position. Um, however. Um, you have to compare basic in income to something. <laughs> and I could easily imagine situations where uh, a basic income is a preferred alternative. Um, so everything depends what, what I'm talking about. Um, and I agree there are some, uh, if you compare it to other forms of uh, welfare systems, there are some, some uh, attractive uh, 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 properties to it. Um, but uh, that, that's, that, that's another discussion. Um, I think it's very important, before we, we, we go into that, to, to talk a little bit about feasibility. What is possible, what's not possible? I and mean, we can discuss this for a very long time, and if it's not feasible, it's, it's, it's not really that interesting. Um, I have done some, some, some very... Um, very simple calculations. Just uh, uh, really not uh, more than back of an envelope calculations, uh, but trying to look at two polar opposite models and to see what would they, what would they imply. And, 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 and I'm, <coughs> I'm looking at a Danish version of a basic income. Um, one model would be uh, to say that we have a, a very uh, extensive welfare state to the market. Some people like that, some people don't. Uh, but let's assume that we are not going to change the standard of living of those who are presently living on their, uh, uh, living on uh, welfare transfers. So, and I'm, in my calculations, I'm excluding the old late pensioners. Um, and you're probably going to ask me about uh, some of the numbers um, and the simple why did you choose that number uh, why did you choose to to uh, to exclude only pensioners well I did these calculations when the Finns started discussing their model uh, which they are uh, I guess they are going, going around and using a slightly different version of it in the experiment but this basically was the ideas that was discussed in Finland at the time. They, they exclude the old internet, so I did that too. If you look at, at uh, the grown up populations, uh, excluding the old age pensioners, um, not employed, they are presently getting around 12,500 a month. How much is that in euros? It, one uh, euro is. Uh, uh, that's for person living alone. Yeah, yes, yes. This is per, per, per head. This is a per, per head count. This is just average. That would that would uh, very very different different kinds of transfer uh, recipients. But that that would be the average. Um, so basically, if uh, somehow. Uh, which we don't have to care about now. We introduce basic in, uh, income for people who are on transfer income. Then we would only have to add a bit uh, for, for people who are not on, uh, on, on, on transfer income, who are, who are working. Um, and let's assume that we're going to, to introduce uh, a, a big in the order of 6,000 uh, Danish kroner. That would be. 
800 euros or so. Um, that would cost uh, around 100 and uh, almost 150 uh, billion base kroners. That's 7% uh, of GDP. Uh, if we were to, to, to finance that by increasing the, 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 the average tax, then you would have to increase by almost 15% of the That would mean our top tax would be around, including everything would be around 80%. That would have a huge effects on the on, on value of tax. Um, so, uh, to, 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 the, 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 the very short conclusion from this is that that would not be a feasible model. That would not be a feasible model. Um, Let's take a different model. Let's assume that, that this could be the whole opposite to, to, to the first model. Let's assume that we uh, take uh, present spending on, on income transfers, um, still including the uh, old age pensioners, and uh, just uh, distribute it uh, among every adult. Um, I would also in include the uh, we discuss how much you should take from the present administrations of various schemes, but let's take uh, what it costs to administer the unemployment insurance. That would be almost 20 uh, billion dollars in uh, you could add. Then you could, of course, um, you could include, the, we, we do have a, a small basic income already today, because we have a uh, a tax free allowance. <coughs> if you could add that, it would be about a thousand kroners a month. Uh, if you add that together, you could, uh, you could get uh, a, a basic income for everyone um, in the order of 5,000 kroners, perhaps uh, taking behavioral effects into account. You, 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 it is not uh, unrealistic that you could get a basic income of about 6,000 kroners a month, or uh, 800 euros. So that would be feasible. That would be a feasible model. Uh, but remember, uh, the average income for people who are on welfare benefits today, it's not 6,000 kroners. It's more than double that. So basically, you would have to uh, more than cut the present uh, standard of living in uh, for, for people who are living on income transfers in half in order to, 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 to make this happen. So, um, my, my conclusion is that uh, if, you, if you want to, um, you, can have a, you can have a basic income in Denmark. Denmark is even uh, a good place to have it because we have such a large uh, number of people who are out of the workforce or, or are out of employment to begin with. So that would make it less expensive uh, to, to do it in Denmark. So it is, it is possible, uh, but you would have to cut the standard of living for people uh, living in, uh, on, 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 on social transfers today substantially. Of course, you could, in between these two polar opposites, you can find various mixes, but that would, uh, would, would be my short presentation of what, what, uh, what do you have uh, to, to, to play with, uh, if, if you want to, to play with this idea. Uh, just to, 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 to end on a more optimistic note, uh, yeah. for, for those of you who are very enthusiastic about the idea, uh, I've been talking here about the general uh, or universal basic income, practically. We could discuss what well, why not include children. I, I didn't, but it would discuss that why not include children if you want to. You could also include the the old age pensioners if if you wanted to. That's uh, that's that's not an important point. Uh, but we're talking about a universal uh, scheme here. You could consider making. Uh, a scheme like the basic uh, income guarantee for selected groups. 
And I think that the best idea I can come up with, if I should find a good thing, would be this could be way to be. Very interesting to, to implement this idea is uh, uh, refugees in Denmark, uh, which presently uh, have a very difficult time getting a foothold on the labor market. Uh, they get an introduction, they get, until they get a foothold on the labor market, they will get and, uh, a transfer payment. You could do that. You could, uh, instead of giving it for, for, for a period until they enter the labor market or enter, or enter the job, you could uh, give it for maybe the first three years, four years, something like that. So you have this as, as, as an income for that period, and if you can find a way into the labor market, uh, then we won't uh, uh, subtract any of the, uh, that thing from it. If you can find select groups like that, you could do it. Actually, we have it already. Just one uh, for one group. That's old age, old age pensioners who decides to stay on on the on the, on the on the labor market. If you do that, you will be able to to transform your your your, your old age pensions into a higher pension when you decide to to retire uh, later on. That really is a sort of a, a basic income guarantee mechanism. But but for a select group, and then it, it might work. I think also the experiment in Finland is for unemployed people, isn't it, isn't it right? So it's also a selected group. Yeah. Yeah. I, did, I did the calculation and it was very early on in the process. So there's so a universal model. I, I didn't yeah. know how it was going to, to play out. So don't, don't read too much Finland into it. No, no sure, but <laughs> yeah, just to say that it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the next speaker is from the alternative. Um, you can all do you have slides as well? No, oh, yes, sure. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Thorsten Guy. I'm a member of Parliament for the Alternative Party, Denmark, or the Green Party. I'm a, sp I'm a spokesman for Labour Market Municip. Municip. Affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Social Service. And I'm a product of uh, basic income. Uh, when I was young, uh, I, was, I grew up in Aarhus, and in the 80s, there was an unemployment of 20%. And uh, in those days, there was a very risk-willing social policy in Aarhus that meant that all of us, thousands of young unemployed, we, we, we were just left to ourselves. And that meant that we created the big environments of uh, project work called the Front Runners. Some of you will know it where we did uh, cultural projects and multimedia projects and social projects and political projects and humanitarian projects and a lot of projects, Mouse House and, 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 and Chaos Pilots and uh, Cafe Kölbert, you, you, you heard about a lot of it. And uh, it meant that we were a lot of people who made, tried to make unemployment into a resource. And we, we made a lot of festivals, for instance, and there, 80% of us were just normal kids. 20% had big problems in their lives. But we worked together because we needed people who could do something else than us, who could put in uh, nails or could stand guard. So we really, everybody needed each other and everybody worked together in making a lot of different projects. And we had 10 golden years in August. I was in the, in the last part. And I became leader of the front runners in 80, in 93. And I spent my first year making 80 speeches from northern to, 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 to groups from, from the whole north that came and tried to find out how did the frontrunners make uh, the unemployment into a resource. And we, told, we, we, we talked about our experiences and we talked and, and, and at that moment there was so much unemployment that nearly everybody thought it was going to stay. I mean, many people were thinking, also politicians, unemployment, 15, 20% unemployment <coughs> is a part of society from now on. I even heard a, a, a politician from this parliament saying, yeah, maybe we're going to live with high unemployment in our life, in our society, as, as far as we can see. And that was interesting, because then we began thinking about what is the Western atheist 
going to put into their lives so they can't depend on consuming material stuff. And it was very, very, it filled us. We, we were very enthusiastic. We're going to develop art and culture and sports and interests and hobbies. We're going to fish and go into the nature. We're going to find out what we're going to do in the post-material society. It was a strong thought. And it lasted two years. <laughs> <laughs> because then, 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 then unemployment fell as far, faster than it came. And in two, three years, we had nearly no unemployment. Well, we still had some. But this whole dream just crashed again. <laughs> but it was very interesting to, 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 to dream it for a while. Uh, and that was where I gained my informal education. That was where I learned what, 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 what later made it possible for me to start a company. I have, I'm a businessman also, I have a small company with five employees. Where we give, we give paper <coughs> for informal learning. We give paper for, for learning that people, they, 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 they learn outside school. Uh, but that it's, it was basic income. And it, it, it made a big, big growth of initiatives. And that's, of course, also why I have been one of the ones who made uh, basic income a kind of a part of the alternatives DNA when we've built this party because I've seen it work uh, and in the alternative party we say that basic income is one of the most interesting visions of our time uh, we do not see it as a goal in itself we see it as an element that might be very important if people are to live good lives in the future that's, that's an element between uh, 30 hours working week a new tax system and, and, and a lot of other things. And it is because that in our crystal, our crystal ball also tells us there's a very big chance that we do not all have to work in the future to keep society running. And that's not only also says that. Elon Musk, the great test, says it too. <coughs> we probably are facing a future where we do not all have to work to keep society running. So we, 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 we have to get the work done and then get on to the fun. Uh, in the alternative part, we want to move, move towards universal ba basic income step by step. The first step is social benefits without requirements, as contained in Mulcahy. The next step is unemployment benefits without requirements, doubting Mulcahy. The third step is universal basic income for everyone. Uh, the first two elements are our official policy. Uh, regarding universal basic income, we are working on finding a model that will work in Denmark and will try to make a Danish, we'll try to make Danish experience and combine the know-how from those international experience that, that goes around all, all over the world at the moment. There's not many real basic income experiences. It is more like social benefits without requirement experiences, for instance in, in Holland and, and Finland. But we want to make, scatter all those things, make it into a model that works, a model for basic income in Denmark. When we make that model, we have to be able to answer a lot of questions that we ask ourselves today. Some of them are, what exact amount of money is a basic income to consist of, as we've discussed before? What is the rate? Uh, how do we finance it? And a very important question, how do we help people getting better health and getting work and getting into society if we do not force them, as we do today? <laughs> Uh, I do not have the complete answers on, all, on, on the first two questions yet. Uh, I'm very happy, happy Otto tried to, to give us some answers. Uh, it'll take hard work to find that exact answers, and if we're not ready to answer those questions very precisely, when we present a model, we will cause a lot of confusion, and that will cause a lot of damage to the whole basic income movement. So we are, we are careful to calculate very much before we, we, we bring out a, a model. But the third question will find its answer if we succeed in introducing social benefit without requirements. That is a question about how we can support people getting into society even if we do not foster them. Uh, our intention is to give unemployed people their welfare benefits without requirements. We want to set the unemployed free. It means that we want to give all unemployed people their welfare benefits without forcing them to do anything in return. The matter is that if you get unemployed, you have to go to a public office to be an administrator who will administrate your life. The administrator will force you to look for a certain number of jobs, no matter if they're interesting for you or not, 
no matter if they're relevant to you or not, no matter if they're 100 kilometers away from you and your family and your network. The administrator will force you to work for a company on your social welfare benefit. He or she will force you to do certain courses or certain activities without getting paid more than your welfare benefit. It also means that the government chases unemployed people around after jobs that do not exist. Uh, even if all the available jobs were taken, we'd still have about 100,000 unemployed people in Denmark. Uh, that's the situation of the Danish Welfare Society today, and that's a shock for people who might get unemployed maybe after 30 years of hard labor. Yesterday you were a hard-paying, hard-working taxpayer, today you're lazy. Yesterday you had a job, today your life is taken over by an administrator. And as it, 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 can, be quite, it, it can happen quite fast. You probably saw the leaders of the social advisors in the media two days ago telling that for all of us, social benefit is only 22 weeks away. Kontanthjælp med kun 22 uger væk. For næsten os alle sammen, selvfølgelig når alle, hvis man er stilling. So we have deep belief that we do not have to force people to work. We believe that everyone wants to be an active part of society. We believe that everybody in this room wants to contrib contribute to society. We trust that everybody who passes down the street wants to, wants to contribute to society. We're sure that contributing to society is a, is a very, very important thing for people. To produce value to society, so other people's lives give meaning to your own life. It means that we want to turn the whole unemployed system around. We've got numbers from our Ministry of Finance telling us that we spent billions of kroners in Denmark forcing the unemployed people to do certain activities, controlling their lives and so on. We want to stop forcing and administering people's lives and spend the millions of kroners, the billions of kroners, to give unemployed people offers of qualifications, health treatment, personal development, that has such a high standard of quality that people says yes to them without being forced. I'll just <coughs> take that in Danish very short. As we see them who eat control we are for our children so go out for time of number two. We want to take billions from force and administration and put them into supporting the single single unemployed individual to take care of that person's issues. Some may need medical support, some need courses. Yeah, it's gonna be too old to so talk. Some need friends, some need love, some just need someone to talk to. Uh, we're sure that everybody knows what is best for him or she. We're sure that if you give people responsibility for their own life, they will take this responsibility and they will never give it away again. And we still want people to be able to say no to all of it if it doesn't make people make sense in their lives. Then we have a lot of critics saying, critics saying that if we do not force unemployed people to do certain activities, they'll just go home and do nothing for the rest of their life, enjoying not to be part of society. They'll just benefit on all the work that the rest of us do. In the alternative part, we do not believe that. No. <laughs> but we cannot say for certain that one out of thousand for a period of time will not sit back on the sofa doing nothing. But we. But if we make the rules and the laws to control one out of thousands, one out of thousands, then we make life a nightmare for all the people who really want to contribute to society. We cannot make rules that tries to control one out of thousands. We have to make laws that support the desire to, to contribute to 999 out of thousands. Therefore, a lot of people will experience that the public demo will keep on knocking on the door. <laughs> Offering to get fresh. So it means in the, in, in, in the society that comes after uh, that we set unemployment free, the society will knock on the door, on your door, with offers, again and again, and will help people develop themselves and their working skills. The great difference is that people can say no, and they can say no again and they can say no forever if they like. That also means that the day they say yes, they take the responsibilities themselves to change their lives. And that's the only way to do it. People have to take back the authority of their own lives. 
the, the, and the, the, we've only seen it happen a few places in Denmark, and I can, we can talk about that later. And that was a very, very good experience. So, first, social benefit without uh, requirements, then, helping uh, with town. <laughs> <laughs> and then, we very much want to find the real uh, model for, for, for this. Thank you. about the authority of your life, because that's also a liberal idea, so maybe that's kind of where you are not so far from each other. But Phil, do you have first some comments to that, or do you want to open discussion? Well, can you open the question? I mean, I have obviously... Uh, maybe I... <laughs> I, I, I first uh, have a short comment. respond uh, two things. One, briefly, so maybe on the Otto's first uh, remark, I think it's a very important objection. Uh, to basic income, so which was the idea that uh, people who are able to uh, look after themselves, to uh, earn a living, should do so, and uh, if uh, it's only if they are unable to, that uh, uh, society should help them. And so it's a standard objection to it. In fact, I intend uh, speaking uh, on that topic uh, tomorrow at the seminar. It's, uh, I noted very early in the debate that uh, the most serious objection, the most emotional objection against basic income was not about funding, was not about the administrative difficulty, economic sustainability, it was that moral objection. That's why I spent a large a chunk of my life writing this book called Real Freedom for All, which is addressed, which I published 20 years ago, and it is addressed exactly to that question and develops a a lecture I gave at Harvard that was later published under the title Why Surfers Should Be Fed, which was uh, responding to the same objection, variant of your objection that was made to me by John Rawls, the main, uh, the founding father of contemporary uh, political philosophy. I just give a, a, a brief uh, answer. That, so in, in our book, chapter five is devoted to that, and uh, I just give the intuition of what I believe the answer is. It's nicely formulated by Herbert Simon, who is a Nobel laureate, American Nobel laureate in, in economics. And he said the following, and, and for me there's something very deep in that and something we are not sufficiently aware of. He said, um, if I ask my fellow American, what's the part of their income that is really owned to their efforts, rather than to the incredibly fortunate circumstances in which they were born, in which they grew up, in which they were educated, in which they could get access to a job. Well, I'd be generous by saying that 10% of that is due to their efforts. All the rest is a present from the past. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's enough to compare, I mean, the, the income of people in the US today doing a particular job, say barber or something, to the income of people doing the same sort of job 200 years ago, or in Calcutta, or Kinshasa, or whatever, and you will have an idea of what's really due to the end. Mm -hmm. So what the basic income does is not take part of the fruit of the work of the hard workers to distribute it to everyone, whatever they do. It's just sharing more equally what we receive. Uh, so it's really, I find it outrageous that we, who are well paid for jobs we enjoy, huh, that we should feel terrible mm -hmm. about a little basic income being given to people even if they choose not to accept to come and clean our shoes. And so this is um, what we are doing with the basic income is just giving a, a modest share in what we uh, inherit. So do you agree that they are free <coughs> not to work? Uh, and and uh, yes, of course, but it's always a relative freedom. If you, if you want, and it's a modest income, and if you want luxury, so well, you have to work for it. And so, so that. I mean, I'm just giving us, and it doesn't exhaust the, the, the Just a, a brief thing, which is an answer uh, to both. For me, the best way of thinking about the model of basic income for the immediate future is indeed, as you suggested, intermediate between your two extremes. In all countries, people do, and it's useful to have an order of magnitude, do the two exercises uh, you, you did and, or you sketched. And, uh, and one consists in saying, well, just take the, num the, the number of adults in the country, multiply by the basic income, and you see the huge cost this would involve on top of the current uh, uh, expenditure. And the other exercise consists in taking, we take whatever we already distribute, 
and we give it equally to all, and then we say how little it is and how unfair it would be to some group. My own model, and at the same time it's an answer to you, my, uh, or, or reaction to your proposal, consists in saying what we must do is a modest basic income that is significantly less than what is currently given in social assistance to people living alone. In some countries it may be equal to what is given to each of the two members of a couple, uh, taking into account the economies of scale and so on. So you give a modest income, insufficient to, to get people out of poverty if they live alone, certainly in, in a city, and then you keep top-ups that remain conditional. So people who live alone <coughs> in a city will receive a housing benefit on, that, on top of that. People who are are on invalidity benefit will need to, to remain at the top. So it's, it's insufficient. But it increases already people's freedom to choose. You can have, because you have this floor on which you can rest, if you want to try a startup, if you want to get further training, if you want to rest a little bit, you, you, you have this. But it's, it's, for me, it's important to go in that way gradually, rather than say, well, we keep the current levels and we give them completely unconditionally. Because that will too easily, because the unemployment trap it creates, that will too easily uh, be interpreted, including by the people who benefit from it, as now we give you the money and we leave you alone. Huh? Mm -hmm. But with the whole difficulty for them of getting back, because you have the unemployment trap, and you, you can only, it only makes sense for you to, to find a job if it pays at least as much as this conditional, uh, 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 this conditional benefit. So it's better to raise the floor, hmm? and give at the same time a greater power to say no to a job because if you if it's a shitty job with an awful boss you can give it up and you are still entitled to it but you can also more easily say yes to a job including as an employee in corporate <coughs> or as an artist or in a startup with uncertainty because there is the floor on which you can stand and so i think in, in all countries there is more than the models that are being elaborated are of that sort it's sometimes called a partial basic income strictly unconditional, but it is sufficient to, to raise people above poverty. So, I, I stop here. Thank you. Before you answer, I think we'll include some questions from the you guys. Uh, any questions? Is that here? Yes. yes. Uh, yes. I have two questions. Uh, can you say who you are? Yes, my name is Diego. How are you guys doing? <laughs> um, I have two questions. One for uh, Otto and one for Peter. Um, for Otto? Now, um, <coughs> A lot of people believe that um, in the future, most of the jobs that we see right now will be eradicated and there might not be a replacement of jobs. Now, you might agree with that or not, but let's, for the uh, cause of arguments, assume that that's the case and that in the future, 90% of all jobs will be gone. Um, if we don't do any kind of redistribution by basic income, for instance, what would you say is a plausible path to uh, take instead? Um, that's my first question. Um, my question for Peter is, um, now you brought up three different uh, examples of, um, of um, where we begin to see to implement basic income on a national level. As I understand it, there have been um, experiments in the past where uh, various um, places have, uh, or governments and so on, have flooded the basic income in the past. And the question is, um, have, have we actually seen basic income being successfully implemented anywhere? Um, what kind of experiences, uh, what kind of empiricism do we have with basic income uh, at this point? Object, please. Yes. Um, very interesting uh, question. Uh, and I actually think we can say a lot more about technology than, than most people realize. We, we don't know what's going to happen, but we can look at different scenarios and actually different scenarios. Economists quite uh, have thought these things through, so, so we are actually quite able to, to, to handle them. Uh, two things could happen uh, as technology develops. One scenario is that the same thing is going to happen that has happened so far. And that means that when we develop new technology, it's complementary to, to labor, so to speak. It means that it, will make us, uh, it won't take away our jobs, it will just make us more productive. Uh, I came here on a bike, 
uh, my bike didn't mm -hmm. take away my job. It uh, actually but just made me more more productive for, for me my work. So I can eat, actually I can eat more <coughs> stuff because I have a bike. So I, it's not uh, I don't have that hard competition for my bike. But let's let's assume that uh, technology is, is going to take a new form. Um, let's assume that it, it can compete directly. Almost by a tractor competes in the horse and in, 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 in the farming sector and in the farming sector. So assume we could produce, my bike can do anything I can do. Uh, uh, much better than me. Since we are talking about cases. Yes. Exactly. If that's going to happen, well, uh, then uh, probably I, I wouldn't earn very much uh, working in that. But in that situation, we are going to see an explosion in wealth because that this is what it would mean. It would mean that our, our productivity would uh, would uh, uh, expand tremendously in that case. In that case, uh, you would be able to earn a living not not so much from working but from uh, saving. Would have a, a very high rate of interest, very high rate of growth in that scenario, and in that case, you would you would be able to finance your basic income basically from, from, from saving. Uh, that would be different from today where labor captures a lot of, of uh, a lot of uh, value we produce. But if, if that changes, I don't think it's going to happen. But if that was going to happen, then uh, savings would be the obvious, uh, obvious path to take. Am I allowed to... Uh uh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, we have to have all the questions. Well, the only variable ratio. Okay. Um, I'm thinking more in terms of if 90% of uh, everybody loses their jobs and they don't have any money and they don't have anything to save up, uh, what will those 90% of people do? That's my actual question. Yeah. I, I don't think that's very likely that from one day to another we just wake up tomorrow and uh, we've been replaced by, by our, our bikes uh, uh, from, 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 from one, one day to the next. So we would see a transformation and that transformation would be important to say. Then would saving would, 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 be, would, would, would be a source of a uh, very important source of income. So that would be my advice in that case. But it's, uh, most probably, I mean, have, have you, how many of you have an iPhone? Have you tried the? Have you tried Siri? Uh, I mean, it's 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 boring. It, it, it's the robot. It's incredible, stupid. Incredible, stupid. <laughs> it's uh, we we can good practice to in, in interact with a senile when you try Siri. Uh, and that's just, that's actually the, the, the level of our uh, robots technology. It's a right picture on machine learning and artificial intelligence. That might change in the future. That might change in the future. But, but for now, uh, we are con uh, machines and people are producing much more than machines. So that, that's our scenario for, for the immediate future. And you Yeah, quick uh, reply to the question. There are two places in the world where an actual basic income is in place, namely Alaska and Macau. Uh, but uh, in both cases, it's a very low level compared to GDP per capita, so it's anecdotal. So it's 2 to 3 percent, so compared. I mentioned 39 percent in. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Swiss proposal, any reasonable proposal in my view should be in the order of short-term proposal should be in the order of 15 to 20 to 20 percent of GDP per capita. There is two to three percent of GDP per capita. Really, that that's not uh, what we can learn from. Uh, now, uh, there have been uh, experiments of a genuine basic income. In less developed countries, we mainly we talk, people talk about the village in Namibia, and more seriously about the number of villages in uh, Madhya Pradesh in uh, India. Uh, but again, it's very low. Uh, something like in four countries, and even relative to the GDP per capita, there it's only five to six percent of GDP per capita. The most relevant experiments for uh, a real basic income here 
are not experiments with the basic income, but with the so-called negative income tax that took place in the United States in the 1970s and in Canada also around uh, that uh, period. It's not a basic income because it's not strictly individual. So the, the amount each household receives is not just um, given by the number of individuals. It's, and so it's less for a couple than for uh, an, for each member of a couple than for a person living alone. So it's not strictly individual. And it's not paid up front. Uh, it's really in, in the most biggest uh, experiment in terms of degree of saturation of a place, which is in Dauphin in, in, in Canada, in, in a little town. Only third, in principle, everyone was supposed to be covered, but because it was a negative income tax, so there was a, an upper limit of the income which you had to have in order to be entitled to to uh, a benefit, and so only a third of the population received it. So it was not universal, but it had in common with the basic income that how much you could keep of your <coughs> benefit was not decreased just for every dollar you earned. You didn't, uh, the, each one dollar of benefit was not taken away. So it, it was a bit similar to a basic income, but not quite the same. What were the, the main results? I won't, yeah, I won't go. Yeah, because I thought it was a successful one, but if yeah. you have all the questions as well. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I rec mentioned, so we discussed this in detail, chapter six, what we can learn from this experiment. In chapter six uh, of the book, I'll just say one thing about that, which yeah, I had a long discussion uh, about this precisely with Jim Tobin, the, the, the American economist. He said there were two main uh, lessons from these experiments, one that there was some reduction in the labor supply of uh, mothers, significant, not big, but significant. And two, there was, uh, in one of the cases, there was an increase in the rate of divorce. He said he was not surprised by it, uh, not disappointed. He thought it was great. It enabled women to uh, reduce the double shift and ex have less exhausting lives and to dump the partner if uh, it was a shitty partner which, uh, uh, with whom they were only staying because they had no alternative. But he said he was at the same time disappointed and well, surprised and disappointed by the fact that these two lessons, uh, these two lessons was, were taken as powerful arguments against doing anything like a negative income tax in the US and the idea was dropped for 30 years practically in the United States. So, but we discussed this at length, and so the, the various experiments, what can be learned and what can not be learned, including from the Finnish experiments in our chapter six, which is on the economic piece Okay, two more questions. I think you had a question. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sam. I, um, I find this a typical welfare debate in the sense that uh, the proponents uh, discuss um, how uh, which goals we could achieve by spending this uh, money, and the opponents uh, discuss how we'll be unable to, to finance it. <laughs> um, because, Philippe, you, you said um, you motivated uh, basic income very well, and you mentioned uh, Switzerland as an example, spending up to 39% of GDP in, if, uh, if voting this uh, proposal through. And then, Otto, you say um, um, it's way too expensive. Uh, it will never um, be able to work uh, with an example um, based on 7% of, of GDP uh, going into these schemes. And then, uh, Philippe, you answer, um, we, mi we might not need to spend all this money, we can just redistribute what there already is uh, given uh, in social benefits. And then I think, <coughs> might there not be some uh, reasons why some receive uh, high allocations uh, uh, and why should that be taken away? And if you are just redistributing uh, what is already spent, you will not have 39, not even 7% of GDP to play with. And then um, your proposal is not a solution to inequality because uh, basic income will be so low. So before we answer, I will take the final question, Laura. Yeah. Uh, my name is Martin Lawson. Um, my question is basically directed at uh, price. Is that correct? Yeah, there is. Uh, your model, what are the basic uh, assumptions behind it? Uh, when you talk of uh, bad employers or bad leadership, are you assuming that uh, leaders will be so bad that people can leave their work to give place to others, for example? And uh, 
if you make some assumptions about the population, how much of the population should be the <coughs> income generating population before this uh, model becomes uh, practical? I think it was Philip, but I guess but this is the final round, so if you each uh, try to sum up and if you have final <coughs> questions, but feel you can start. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't much sure I, I got the, the, the last question, but I, I uh, replied. I think there was a misunderstanding about what I was proposing. I'm not proposing at all, I'm saying some people are making this computation for the sake of getting an order of magnitude, namely uh, let's redistribute all the uh, all the existing benefits equally among all. Sometimes leaving aside, as you did, uh, the all the, the pensions for elderly people. Sometimes leaving aside the child benefits, etc. But that's not at all what I'm proposing. And so, what I'm proposing is a, a lower level of basic income, but with top-ups and with complements that remain conditional, so that someone who is now on an employment benefit because that person has lost a job well, it will receive, say, the equivalent of 400 euros or 500 euros unconditionally. And then, what if the current unemployment benefit for someone in that situation, given the, the previous earnings, is, uh, say, 800 euros? Well, there is an additional, if it's 500 euros basic income, there is an additional 300, which is conditional, which he only gets as long as he, is, he or she is involuntarily uh, unemployed. And then, the, the, in terms of the, the funding, and so it's in all these schemes, it must go hand in hand, as you suggest also, with the reform of the personal income tax, ta uh, income, personal income taxation, so that you get rid of the exemption, which you have, uh, the tax exemption, you refer to that. I was surprised by how little it was in, in, uh, in, in the Danish case, but, uh, and so in all our systems, the lower tranche of income is tax-free, this would be suppressed. Uh, often there is then a, a next uh, a tranche which is taxed at 20% or 25% uh, marginally. This may not be the case here. But the idea is really that you tax at a high level from the first crown or for the first, uh, from, from the first uh, euro. And in, in a way, you all the, even the richest people in this country receive a present from the tax ministry in the form of an exemption of uh, taxation on their lower uh, on the lower part of their income. This would be all scrapped and would help, of course, in, uh, fund the basic income. <coughs> and all this, what you do there by taxing everyone at, at a high level, 40% or 50% on, on the lower tranche, of course you then don't need to adjust them by increasing the higher uh, marginal tax rate because a lot is taken there. And of course you self-finance um, or you scrap all the benefits that may be lower than this. The thing is, the question was about whether you solve the inequality problem. I said, whether we have, yeah. so we have progressive taxation and whether this is so, so maybe you could just briefly reflect on that. Yeah, that and that, yeah. Yes, but, that, that, and, but it's important, of course, and to see that I'm not increasing inequality, which I would do if I was just taking all the, the existing benefits and, um, and, and distributing them uh, to all. So it depends on the, the index of inequality you take. But the way in which this help, uh, helps address inequality is twofold. One, with the sort of means tester schemes that are in place, many people don't get what they are entitled to. It looks good on paper, but many people don't know what they are entitled to, or they are so stigmatized or humiliated by going to apply to it, yeah. then <clears throat> in, some, in some countries to a very extensive uh, uh, very extensively, they don't get what they're entitled to. So you reduce inequality, which is often invisible by reducing this uh, unseen poverty through having a system that's less humiliating and uh, requires less information. That's one. And two, because it operates as a floor, you help solve this poverty trap. And so everyone can, can stand on this floor, and the people who are currently trapped in the situation of, of unemployment can more easily get access to a job because they can combine the benefit with a part-time work, with an apprenticeship, with an internship, uh, which will then gradually help them get a higher income in a, in a dynamic way. Thank but you, of I course, it depends on the level. So, and then there's also the option. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, uh, Philip. Uh, thank you for your very good presentation. Uh, I think that we will lose 
about 800,000 800, known jobs in the next 10, 20 years. Nobody knows if it's true, but that's, that's what big thinking <coughs> tanks think. Uh, that's known jobs. Nobody knows how many new jobs that we do not know uh, the name of right now will be created. Nobody knows. Uh, in this house, here, the Labour Minister only see one way, and that's the other way, that it will create growth, 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 growth. Incredible much growth. Elon Musk says that only a short percentage of us have to work to keep society running. And I will say that it is, it is risky only to have one plan. There's only one plan in this house. It is we're going to need labor very, 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 very much. In the com if I was the labor minister, I would begin thinking about a plan B. It is like all of us doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, that is a that risky way to make, 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 make policies. So I would start, if I was a minister, at least to consider other ones. Yeah. Just uh, a final thought. Um, where we might take this idea, it's, uh, I admit there is some, some uh, attractiveness to the idea of basic income, it is that uh, you get an income, you can you can decide on your own what you want to do with the money, uh, you could, uh, and I guess the reason why it was in Friedman was uh, attracted to the idea was that you take a lot of money spent on social programs. Uh, on bureaucrats and things like that, and people say that's better spending on money, uh, spending on people directly. Um, if we look at the situation in Denmark today, we have one area where uh, there's a lot of spending going on on behalf of people. It's not on transfer income, it's on public consumption. Uh, we have an extremely high level of public consumption in Denmark, and more than 70% of it is consumed by individuals. It's not collected goods, uh, it's consumed by individuals, but where the decision is made not by, uh, it's not by the, the individuals, but by the, the producers, which is the, 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 the government sector. That I think that, that, education. Education. that includes everything, uh, where you can, you can uh, attach to individuals. I think taking this idea and saying, perhaps instead of giving people uh, finished goods as we do today, giving them money and uh, giving them the money instead and making uh, them take the, the system on their own. That's uh, perhaps uh, the most obvious avenue I see for the idea of Denmark today. Okay, thanks a lot. Then we have heard different types of argument and I hope that you will continue the debate elsewhere. But uh, thanks a lot and thank you for being here. Thank you so much.